Um, I should also thank the KDU um, for this a very kind invitation um, uh, to be on this extremely um, respected uh, panel of speakers. Um, there are well-known international experts with us. It was just a month or two months ago that I was um, talking with my students about a very famous uh, arbitration award. Uh, on the law of the sea, the South China Sea arbitration. Um, and I did not know that I would be on the same panel with one of the uh, judges uh, who sat uh, on that bench. Um, and we also have uh, very respected uh, teachers, the uh, former Attorney General, uh, professors of the law, uh, who have been uh, very inspiring to me personally, not so long ago. Uh, the theme is law and justice in the global environment and this is a theme that raises a number of uh, questions. For international law students, uh, it raises the critical question of the relationship between international law and justice. And this is not surprising, the question uh, about the relationship between international law and justice. Uh, has always engaged great minds uh, who thought about uh, international law. Uh, international law and justice follow each other very closely. If you read some of the books uh, and articles written about international law, you might see the two concepts almost going together. It's almost as if at times that you can't uh, talk about one without uh, referring to the other. Uh, and of course, finally, it is an issue which has affected, uh, or it is, which is affecting a lot of people around the world, uh, and also, in particular, uh, the peoples in Sri Lanka. Uh, there are many stories that can be told about this relationship, and my purpose here is to set out two stories. One is a somewhat traditional, somewhat mainstream, story about this relationship, a very optimistic story. Um, and students of international law are generally exposed to this when they start their, or when they engage in their undergraduate studies. Uh, this story is about the positive relationship between um, international law and justice. So according to this story, uh, the roots of international law go back centuries, uh, perhaps to the wonderful teachings of the religious leaders. Uh, there is reference to basic principles or teachings in the Hindu scriptures, for example. Um, there is reference to something like the kingless authority of the law, which has been interpreted by one of my former mentors, um, Chassiji Viramantri as a reference perhaps to something like international law many, many centuries ago. Uh, the story also refers to uh, the idea that the development of international principles was slow. Uh, there is the reference midway to something called the Peace of Westphalia, where European states and entities got together uh, to end the 30 year war, uh, which was uh, a big problem in Europe. Uh, and international law in the form of international treaties helped to prevent the recurrence of war. Uh, from that, you also uh, talk about the great thinkers of international law Victoria, Hugo Grotius. Uh, People who were first talking about international law in the most scientific, holistic manner. Then you get to the birth of modern international law and institutions. And there's a reference in particular to uh, the development of principles such as the international humanitarian law. The late 18th, late 19th, and early 20th century, we find reference to the uh, 
see the roots of these humanitarian principles. Uh, reference to international institutions such as the ICRC and also uh, the various peace conferences. And in all these stories, there is some attachment to the idea of justice, uh, especially in the form of uh, IHL, International Humanitarian Law. Uh, there is certainly a linkage uh, with the issue of justice because IHL is largely about ensuring justice to people uh, who are affected by war and armed conflict. You then get to what is sometimes known as the heroic period of international from the 1920s um, up to about the 1960s. There is firstly a new hope uh, coming from or promoted by a very famous uh, President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, in the 1970s, 1980, around that time, was talking about a new world order based on states which were made up from the consent of the government, uh, a great promoter of international law and justice, uh, but in particular the principle of self determination. Uh, then steps are taken to establish something like a world government, not clearly, but uh, small steps are taken in that, in that uh, direction. The League of Nations is established. Uh, we find international judicial bodies being established, the Permanent Court of International Justice, which later becomes the International Court of Justice. We find the great ideas of international criminal law, which had to do about justice argument um, being discussed by the great idealists uh, and the great international law scholars, Hirsch Lauterbach, for example, who first talked about an international criminal court in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, then you get the UN system, which is currently the foundation, the foundation of the current uh, international legal and political order. And what is one of its purposes? Its main purpose, or one of its main purposes, is to maintain international peace and security, and to that end to settle disputes in conformity with principles of justice and international law. So there again, justice and international law uh, are seen to be going together. You get the Europe of Charter, uh, again, about justice. Uh, the Europe of Charter comes about somewhere in 1945. Uh, it's predominantly about promoting justice to people affected by a terrible war. We also told about decolonization. International law helps a large number of people in the third world to attain freedom from colonial rule. And the principle that is supposed to help us is uh, the principle called for the right to self-determination in international law. The story is on it. There are um, After a period of about 30, 40 years uh, in which nothing much happened, perhaps in the 1990s, we find a rejuvenation um, in, in international legal thinking. Uh, the Cold War is over. Uh, there is a lot of literature about self determination again, internal self determination, promoting the right to democracy of peoples. Uh, justice. Uh, new tribunals are established, the Yugoslav Tribunal, Rwandan Tribunal, again to promote justice to the peoples. The ICC comes about. And uh, uh, this was again, as I said, the old idea uh, that was promoted by uh, Sir Hirsch And more recently, we had the Nuclear Ban Treaty of 2017. Uh, another wonderful moment uh, that is said to have promoted the cause of justice and peace around the world. And in this way, the story suggests that things are not easy. Uh, certainly things are not easy. But we are slowly getting, and as in the words of Charles Viramantri, the late Charles Viramantri, we are perhaps slowly moving towards that place, that sunlit tattoo of peace and justice that humanity for centuries uh, 
has been dreaming about. But is this the only story that we can narrate about international law? Now, I won't say that what I just said is wrong. Uh, there are certain, I mean, factually, these are correct statements. But there's another darker side, the darker story, that I think we should be mindful of. And this darker story is not one which tells you that there is a complete opposite of what I just said. Uh, that would have been a very simple way of putting it. But this darker story tells you that, well, international law may be about promoting justice as well as injustice. And at times, it may be difficult for some to uh, differentiate between justice and injustice, as is always the case. We can refer to the moment when the international community was set up, or the idea of the international community was, uh, in a sense, promoted in 1648, the Peace of Westphalia, which I referred to uh, in the previous book. Now, the Peace of Westphalia was about stopping uh, war. It was about stopping the recurrence of war. But ask the question from a justice perspective. What happened to the people who were subject to uh, such a brutal war for 30 or years? The Peace of Westphalia was a moment uh, that did not judge the people who fought. It was largely about preventing war. It was not really about justice. You take the early principles of international. Uh, and international law can be seen as not something that prevented colonialism, but as precisely something that promoted colonialism. Take the work of uh, some leading critical scholars like Professor Tor Yangi, who pointed out that the principle of sovereignty, which is central to international law, was promoted uh, by uh, the great scholars Victoria and various countries as a way of ensuring a distinction between the sovereign and the less sovereign or the non-sovereign, between the civilized and the uncivilized. Um, and the question that we don't ask about these principles is how or who decided that one part of the world was considered to be sovereign and the others were not sovereign? What was international law saying about uh, the justice of peoples around the world at that time? International law principles uh, helped in the promotion of colonialism. There were concepts developed. Terranalius is one concept that comes to uh, The idea being that territory does not belong to anyone. You enter these territories, get hold of them, and there's another international law principle which tells you that you cannot prevent or you cannot resist colonization if you, and if you do, there will be a war that is just, that could be justly based against you. And that was international law of those days. Um, Self-determination. Stories, popular mainstream narratives will tell you that international law helped decolonization of the world. Uh, that international law granted self-determination to peoples. But was that really the case? Who in the first place decided that certain parts of the world were not qualified enough to self-determine or engage in the process of self-determination? Um, and these are questions that are not really asked uh, by, by a lot of people. Take the moment of uh, that the UN, the establishment of the UN, and there's a wonderful uh, irony here that again uh, does not uh, appear before us unless we uh, do a bit of probing. This was one of those great seesaw moments in, in the development of international law and international legal order. The UN Charter was signed on 26th June 1945. And why was that? There's a lot of things about the international law, justice being said in the each other, prevent war, scourge of war, and so forth. But a month and a few days after, that was when 
on the 6th of August to be precise, that was when Hiroshima bombing takes place. That was after the UN Charter was adopted, or rather was opened as a secretion. Two days after, we get the Nuremberg Charter, that was again about justice, being issued, um, which trivialized many, many activities. Uh, I think consider it consider that we should be illegal. But one day after, on the 9th of August, we get the bombings in Nagasaki. And what do you think about justice in this particular context? How do we understand the concept of international law and justice here? We talked about the Nuremberg Charter, the Nuremberg uh, structure, but Nuremberg was also one of those moments, if you observe critically, one of those moments when uh, a lot of leaders had a lot of doubts about whether there should be prosecution in the first place. The critical history of Nuremberg tells you that when this issue came up in 1945, somewhere in February, that Britain and Churchill in particular were against the idea of prosecution. And they had wanted, this is their online, you can easily Google that and read it. Uh, Churchill, in particular, uh, wanted some of the main Nazi leaders to be executed, not prosecuted, because he knew very well the irony or the dilemma of. of establishing tribunals and getting the accused to speak. And he perhaps knew that things might be something like a short time at the end of the day. And why was the Nuremberg Charter or why was the Nuremberg uh, Plan executed? Well, it was about justice, no doubt, but it was also because President Roosevelt thought that the United States people would like it. And Stalin, who thought that, well, there's a great propaganda effect if you establish a tribunal. So this is also a story about international law and justice. And we talked about nuclear weapons. Well, it's nice to have a treaty, but it seems that all, almost all the countries in the world have accepted or will accept it sometime in the future, in the near future. Uh, except for a few states, and who are those states? States which have nuclear weapons. And if you ask international law, the critical question, is the international law saying that nuclear weapons are illegal even when the very existence of the state is under threat? Well, I don't know what international law will say. Uh, I'll just conclude by referring two or three factors uh, which suggest why this relationship is a difficult one, this relationship between international law and justice. One is because the nature of international law is such that it uh, makes it difficult for people to uh, achieve justice because international law on the one hand has to respect state interests, the main subject or the actor in international law is still uh, the state. And states operate on very different principles of sovereignty, territorial integrity, uh, security and so on. But international law also has to respond to the concerns of uh, the individual, of human rights. And individuals operate on a very different uh, set of assumptions, uh, freedoms, liberties and so on. So there's always going to be that clash between international law and justice. What about justice? Uh, justice, again, is a concept which is utterly personal. Uh, what does justice mean? Well, I don't know, uh, because justice could mean many things to many people. Even since the ancient Egyptian kings, uh, justice was something that was defined in the way that the person would want to define uh, and, and, and the ancient kings in Egypt considered that what was justice was what the Pharaoh's king considered to be good, and what was evil was what the king considered to be bad. 
And even today, if you ask anyone about justice, uh, he would say uh, something very different what you think of justice. And finally, justice is unpredictable. You should not know uh, what you want from justice. You might think that you want certain things, but once that is realized, you might think that there is something more to be attained. Um, so finally, I think it's somewhat unfair to demand international law uh, to promote justice all the time. Because international law is ultimately a modest tool. It is a human construct. It's something that we make by ourselves, uh, something made by actors which have various interests. And therefore, uh, you cannot expect to do too many things with international law. And when talking about international law justice, I think the question that the audience have to be asked uh, firstly, what international law are we talking about and whose justice are we talking about? At the moment we start asking this question, at the moment we start looking for answers to these questions, we get to know that the relationship between international law and justice is not going to be a very happy one. Thank you.